Is Affinity Photo 2 worth the upgrade? Let's find out. Hello, my friends. How are you doing? So today, Affinity Photo 2 has launched together with Affinity Designer 2 and Affinity Publisher 2. All apps, all platforms, no subscription. Let's have a look see at the pricing page, what that means. So they have a universal license on offer for all the software and all the apps together for all the platforms, which includes Windows, Mac and iPad for 120 euros. That is pretty good as an offer. But if you only need one of these software tools, Affinity Photo 2 with the discount is going to be around 49 euros down from 85 five euros all right then i guess we had a bit of a price spike here but still with the discount it is cheaper than affinity photo one sadly though if you already have affinity photo one there is no upgrade price next let's have a look at the software and i want to say it's kind of a mixed bag because they added some things we have asked for a long time and they are really beautiful but at the other side they haven't added some stuff that i would expect from modern software so i'm really happy but also a little bit disappointed so let's get into what i mean by that first of all as you can see here we have a redesign of the ui which is pretty cool we have new icons here they are beautiful but in some cases a little bit less recognizable for example down here we have the healing brush and you can see it looks a little bit like a sparkling makeup brush but when we look at the version one of affinity photo the healing brush had the shape of a patch you would put on your skin so you could identify with that a little bit easier also the healing brush had a distinct different color from the icons around while right now you can see there's a lot of blue in here that makes many of these icons look pretty similar next we go to file new and they have updated this menu you can see here your account when you can download everything you bought from the store you can make a new file open a file from your hard drive you can see the recent files you used you can open up your templates and also download samples to see how affinity photo works now when we are in the new menu one thing i really enjoy is that now they have here a preview that shows you the different ratios of the formats and that is beautiful because when we look at version one here you can see that all of the icons are exactly the same now the downside of that decision is first First of all, this text here is very small even right now when I have a 1080p resolution but also you need to click on every single one to see the preview for the ratio so a mix of that ratio preview in this kind of style where I can simply scroll to that would be very beautiful one huge benefit in here is that with this heart icon you can set favorites so next time you come you click on the heart up here and only see the formats you often use another thing that i don't enjoy so much about the ui is that there is no way to scale the ai or scale the text which I kind of would expect from modern software. For example, when we look into FL Studio, which is a music software, we have a way to scale the UI, scale the pop-ups, set the PPI value of my screen. I can also scale the toolbars and I can scale the cursor individually. That is pretty amazing. But let's get back into Affinity Photo 2. When I go here to File Open and I open up a RAW file, this is going to load into the developer persona as usual and you can make your adjustments as you have seen. By the way, I'm kind of sure that they improved the shadow and highlights adjustments because I'm much, much happier with the results I'm getting here. So I'm really enjoying that. Now, the amazing thing is when I go up here, I can choose the output format, which is a pixel layer, raw layer embedded, which means the raw file is going to be saved inside of your Affinity Photo file, raw layer linked, which means there is a representation of that raw, but it is not not saved with the affinity photo file so they are two different files after all and when I click on that and click develop this will be put in my layer tab as a raw layer now here's another critique point I am having because 
you can see here that my curves adjustment is a child layer. And when I double click, this will open up inside of the developer persona and I can readjust my settings here. That is really beautiful because that means all of the developer persona adjustments are non-destructive. But I am able to hide all of the other layers to see just my raw file. I make this up here with the check mark. When I click on that, nothing changes. Why does nothing change? Well, the curves layer is a child layer and thus not treated as another layer. So we have to drag this out of here to make it a separate layer. And now when I click and bring my raw file back and click up here on the check mark, you will see that the curves layer is hidden and I only see my raw adjustment, which is really great. But it also means I can't use any child layers with my raw layers right now. So I think they I need to update this. Let's talk more about layers here because they have some pretty cool new features. First of all, down here when I click on adjustment layers and for example, I create a curve adjustment and I create a levels adjustment and I create an HSL adjustment, you can see that all of them have distinct different icons. So I can see what they do, not just from the name of the layer, because I can change that, but also from the icon, which makes it easier visible. Another improvement now is that it's much easier to handle layers and distinguish between clipping layers and child layers. Let me create a rectangle over the photo like this. You can see it is a separate layer. Now when I drag this onto the thumbnail of my raw layer, this is going to turn into a clipping layer. Instead, when I drag this onto the name of my raw layer, this is going to become a child layer. This is why right now the rectangle is still visible. One of the cool new masks in Affinity Photo 2 is the Luminosity Mask. For that, we go down here to our mask selection, Luminosity Range Mask. And you can see here we have a preview. When you click on that, we have a live preview of the luminosity selection that is happening. Now, in this case, for example, I say I want to have contrast, but only on the darker parts of the image. So let's create an adjustment for contrast in here and then a mask for luminosity and drag that onto our contrast. Open up the contrast adjustment. Let's bump this up. And you can see this would blow out our bright areas. I can hardly see the doors in the background anymore. So that's no bueno. But now if I go into my luminosity mask here, I can drag this down and you can see now that I see my doors again, while at the same time I have more contrast on dark areas of the image. And of course I can adjust this with the sliders in any way I want. The other mask we now have is our hue range. And with this, I have this color circle here where I can adjust the range that I want to have as a mask for the color. We also have a preview again. And we can also invert the output to make a mask on everything but that color. Now I want to show you one of the downsides here, which is the blur radius. Again, I said this is making the mask softer, but when I'm using the blur radius, what you can see here is because this is a Gaussian blur and not a median blur, that the blurred area is growing. You can see over here around the shape of our object. Also, when you look here in that area, you can see that we are growing a dark line here along that edge. This is typical for a Gaussian blur, while with a median blur, these shapes would still stay in their form and only the insides would be blurred. Now the bandpass mask is a mix between a low band filter and a high band filter. So this kind of does a little bit what you would find in edge detection. So you can see we can have here these high contrast elements, these edges that can be found and we can make a mask of them. And depending on how you move this, you can have a bigger or smaller range of these edges. And this means you can apply adjustments just to these edges and details. So in this case, if I would combine this with a curves adjustment, I drag the band pass on that. Now look at the bubbles here. When I pull down the curve, you can see 
that they become brighter or darker and at the same time become crisper and have more contrast but just at these edges not at the rest of the image so that can be very useful. Now, while all of these new masks are very beautiful, I want to show you now what I meant by having features that I would expect for modern software. So let's switch over here to Lightroom Classic and here we have Smart Selection. So you can see we have here a photo with four people in it and when I click here on my masking tool, this will understand that we have four people in here and select them for me. And you can see here the person on the right doesn't even have the face visible but still she is understood as a person. Also I can automatically select the sky or the background. Now here I have an image with just one person and when we click on that person you will see that I have a choice for just the skin in the face, the body skin, the eyebrows, the eye whites, the iris and pupil, the lips, the teeth and the hair so I can automatically create masks for each of them and then individually adjust them. Another thing in modern software is AI enhanced filters. For example in Photoshop we find depth blur that will automatically measure the depth in a room of an image and when I now click on different areas in the image you can see that now the table here is in focus while the background is in blur and when I click on that red chair you can see that now the red chair is in focus while the table is blurred and this blur is stronger or weaker depending on the distance from the focal point. Another thing that you can do in Photoshop is called Super Zoom which is AI enhanced upscaling which means that you can increase the resolution of an image easily two, three, four times and the image is not just having more pixels but the AI enhancement is creating crisp details inside of that higher resolution. Sadly Affinity Photo 2 has none of these content aware or AI enhanced filters or selection methods. Another improvement that Affinity Photo 2 has for masks is compound layer masks. So for that I'm going to create a selection here like this and make a mask of that. And then I'm going to create another selection like this and make another mask of this. And right now they are simply combined and leave me just with the middle part. So to avoid this I click on my image layer then click on the mask icon and select compound mask. With this selected I'm going to drag my two masks onto the compound mask and click here on the arrow to open this up. Now you can see that I have a new icon in here. When I click on that I'm getting the choice between add, subtract, intersect and XOR and you can already see what the effect of that is. Add both of these masks are added together. Subtract this mask is subtracted from the mask below that. Intersect I only have the two parts where the masks are. XOR I see everything where the masks don't overlap. Now here's something for the designers. Let's create a rectangle in here and as you know up here we have a fill that is usually a color but now you can also use an image in here. So let's drag from my files here a seamless tile into the fill and you can see that now this is in here. And when I resize this you can see that the texture is getting smaller, it's also squishing but if I don't want to have that I can do something really cool. Let's make this smaller then go over here to our gradient tool and when I uncheck scale with object look what happens. Back to my move tool now when I change the shape this will simply repeat my texture. This can be very useful for designers, for game developers and also for artists of course. Another thing they improved is displacement. So here we have two shirts and I have a logo I want to add on top of that. So let's move this over here to the front side and then switch to the blend mode multiply. That already looks pretty good. Let's make the opacity a little bit lower like that. But what you can see here is that it is still flat. So we want to displace this. For that we could go up to the filters but now displacement is a live filter. So go down here to the live filters to displacement and here you have the settings. 
Now the first thing we can do here is to load from layer beneath and you can see that this is bending the image to our background. Now the problem still with this method is that you can see that the edge is getting very pixelated and fizzly here and if I increase the strength this is looking like a bubbly soda. What actually is missing from this function is to be able to blur the loaded background so you have to do that by hand. The way you would do that is to create a Gaussian blur for your image with a setting of 1 to 2 pixels. Also click here on Preserve Alpha, then an HSL adjustment, drag down the saturation so this image becomes black and white and export this as a JPEG. Now go back to the logo with the live displacement applied to it and instead load map from file. Click on this. Here we have my prepared displacement JPEG and as you can see now the edges look nice and smooth. Even if I increase this they stay rather smooth although they become a little bit wiggly. So it's not 100% but, but it is working a lot better with this kind of workaround. And another improvement here is because this is a live filter I can still move the logo around and it will displace depending on the background. Let me know in the comments if you think Affinity Photo is worth the upgrade. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching. Bye! Oh, you're still here. So uh, this is the end screen. There's other stuff you can watch like this or that. It's really cool. And yeah, I hope I see you soon. Uh, leave a like if you haven't yet. And well, um, yeah.